Good morning. It's my joy to welcome you here. Uh, happy Mother's Day if you're celebrating today. Uh, thank you for spending part of your day here with us. Um, the first announcement I want to make is that the, the reason that we're printing the bulletin this way is so that then I can just take this file and literally put it in the email that goes for the, um, the online worship service. Um, so, all of the hymns for today are in the blue hymn book. If you're having trouble um, seeing, the, seeing the type, particularly for the good morning guys, um, if you're having trouble seeing the type, particularly for the hymns, uh, the numbers, the numbers are right there. Just look them up. Look them up in the in the regular hymnal in the queue. Um, so you're more than welcome to do that. Um, Zoom devotions are still being held online. I think we're going to continue that for the foreseeable future. Um, and also, we're going to be uh, holding uh, the summer book group uh, this year. We're going to be holding that online as well. Um, if you're interested in doing that, that's going to be our usual uh, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Uh, time slot that we've had for a couple years now, um, but it'll be on Zoom. And if you'd like to participate in that, uh, let me know. We'll get you a copy of the book. We're not going to use the library this year. We're just going to see if we can find used copies um, online. Um, so that we don't have to have to deal with the library this year. Okay. Once again, prayer requests are found in the bulletin, um, but we're not going to be uh, speaking them out loud again because we have the we have the recording here. We want to be be respectful of people's privacy. Um, the one that I think I can lift up is. Uh, Prayers of thanks for um, Grace Robertson and Tanner Shade's wedding yesterday. It was really very sweet. Um, just their um, immediate families. And um, it's always so cute to see a big, strong guy who spent time in the army just kind of lose it at the sight of the first sight of his bride. It was really uh, very sweet, and we're going to pray for them uh, as they start off their life together. Would you join me this morning in the call to worship? On days we think God has nothing to do with work or family or the world, the Word tells us of one who was a carpenter, who wandered the streets, who upset his family. On days that we think the purpose of life is to make more money and sacrifice our relationships to do so, the word speaks of a life of giving away of ourselves and finding a community as we do so. On days aching with loneliness and empty of love and laughter, the word draws us into the embrace of God's open heart. Would you please stand for our first hymn? Again, it's in the blue hymn book. It's number 556. Now thank we all our God.
kind of have this know, deal going on where we baptize our children, God claims them as his children, and then the child is given back to the parents to raise as best they can um, and to show them things like it is God who guides us when perplexed as well as it is our parents. And our parents often work through God. And one of the ways in which our parents sort of train us up in the faith is to admit when we've done wrong. And so that's what we do every Sunday, uh, both in front of God and in front of each other. So let's join together and confess our sins using the prayer of confession. Let's pray together. Redeeming God, how easily we say we would follow you, but how often we live as if we don't have a clue as to what that means. We choose to gossip about our friends rather than going to them directly and surrounding them with love. Our competitive nature wills us to win at all costs when we could be engaged in service that costs us. We expect others to do for us and rarely ask what we might do for them. Forgive us, Holy One. Set us free to serve in love and compassion. Help us to feast on the fruit of the Spirit offers to us. Put us on the path of faithful discipleship as we walk with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Children of God, it is my joy to remind you and myself that God truly is a loving parent and deals with our faults and our mistakes as a loving parent would deal with them. We are forgiven through the love and the grace and the mercy and the nurture of God. That's why we are forgiven. No other reason. Thanks be to God. Thank mm -hmm. Where we're going and where the scripture is going, we do stumble a little. 
Um, so let's let's wander through them like lost sheep and see what God has to say to us this morning. Our first scripture is Genesis chapter 19, uh, beginning at verse 9. This is in the middle of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, we think we know where the story is going. It can be a stumbling block for us. Um, so we're going to start with verse 9. And the they that is speaking, it starts out that they reply. The they that is speaking is this, this mob of people attacking Lot. But they replied, stand back. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien and he would play the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near the door to break it down. But the men inside, these are, these are angels sent from God, the men inside <clears throat> reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them, and they shut the door, and they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they were unable to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of the city. But Lot lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and led him outside the city. So they basically dragged him out of his house, out of the walls of the city. When they had brought them outside, they said, Flee for your life, do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the hills, or else you will be consumed. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, your servant has found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot flee to the hills. For fear the disaster will overtake me and I die. Look, that city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to the, the, the angel said to Lot, Very well, I grant this favor too, and will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore the city was called Zoar, which means little. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife, behind him, looked back. And she became a pillar of salt. Woo. Let's get that back where it belongs. There we go.
Our New Testament lesson is Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 51. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, to sort of, you know, prepare the way and find places for him to stay. But the Samaritans did not receive him, because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But the disciples said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. May God bless this reading of his holy word. So the story of Lot and his family escaping the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is Really, it's something right out of a disaster movie. I mean, you can, if you want to think of it as a zombie movie, if you want to think of it as, you know, some sort of alien invasion movie, it doesn't really matter, but you, you, you kind of have the scene of the bad guys closing in on Lot, and then all of a sudden the door behind him opens, and these superheroes, these sort of heavenly creatures, blind the bad guys, then they grab Lot by the shoulders, give him a good shake, and say, you got to get out, man! Get your family and leave! So Lot goes to his sons-in-law and says, we got to get out now! The city's going to explode! And his sons say, his sons-in-law say, yeah, right. And then that's the end of the scene. And we awake the next morning in the house. You can maybe kind of imagine that the... The windows have been boarded up, or, you know, there's, there, everyone's sitting on the floor eating whatever food is left over, and, you know, like saltines and ketchup or something like that. Because the first onslaught seems to have died back. But we're all still huddled in there with the superheroes. And once again, they take Lot by the shoulders and shake him and say, You gotta get out, man! Take everyone! Run! Run far! Don't look back! But Lot hesitates. Like in any good disaster movie, there's always the guy who refuses to believe what's going on around him again. So they have to drag him and his family outside the city gates. And now that they're outside of the city, they again say, run, flee for your life, head for the hills, and don't stop till you reach them. Well, says Lot. And well, you know, there are other stories of Lot in the Bible that you sort of get that Lot is a bargainer. Lot is not going to do what he's told without some sort of negotiation. Lot is the one who um, promised Jacob Rachel and ended up giving him Leah as well. Right? The, the, you know, oh, you have to marry my first daughter. You know, there was, there was a whole trickery going there with Lot. So Lot, still refusing to believe that this is as bad as the superheroes are saying, starts bargaining. Why don't we go in the hills? What about that little city down there? See that one way off there? It's little. It can't be worth 
worth destroying. It can't be that sinful. It can't be that awful. It can't get into that much trouble if it's so little. How about you spare that tiny little city, and we'll go there. Because we don't want to start all over again up in the hills. We're city people. And he calls it a little city so much that they, that's what they actually name the city. It means little. And the angels, the superheroes, are like, okay, okay, fine, 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 fine. Just go. We need to get on with this, and you're holding it up. And his Lot and his family are finally running. His wife, his poor, unnamed wife, looks back one last time and gets the brunt of all the delay that Lot and his sons-in-law have done. And like the one person who makes the mistake of turning back or freezing with regret in the disaster movie, Zach, she gets overwhelmed, consumed, destroyed, Jesus, when he was standing on the outskirts of that Samaritan town and listening to his disciples, had this story in the back of his mind. When the disciples volunteered to call down fire on this Samaritan town because it too rejected God's way of doing things. See, Jesus. The, the scripture makes a big deal, again, of, of saying twice, Jesus has fixed his eyes on Jerusalem. He's going to continue teaching and preaching and healing. But now he is focused on the faith that God has for him. He's focused on the crucifixion. And he's not easily distracted. Right? It, it says that, you know, they passed through because Jesus had his eyes set on Jerusalem. It's because he doesn't have time to convince the Samaritan village to accept him or not. He's moving forward. And he's going to go with them or without them. And his disciples want to linger there. And prove to Jesus and force the Samaritan city. That Jesus is the Son of God. They want to they prove it to this city. They want to force this city to follow. And they're going to do it by raining down God's wrath to prove that this guy is really powerful. But Jesus can't let them get stuck there. They can't get stuck in doing things the way they want to do them. Or they're never going to make it to Jerusalem. So he pushes them past it. He pushes them forward. They move on to another village. Come on, forget about them. We've got bigger fish to fry. Well, at the same time as pushing them forward, he... he he does this amazing pivot. See, they're, they're focused on proving to this Samaritan city that they need to follow Jesus. This is the guy you want to follow. And we're going to prove it by destroying your city so you have no other choice but to come along with us. And he pivots away from the Samaritans following. And he moves his concern to this sort of motley gang of followers who have already decided to follow him. You've got these sort of litany of road conversation snippets that happen while they're walking to the next village. And in every one, Jesus cautions them about having the same problem that Lot had. I'm telling you to go to go right now, to follow me right now. Ask yourself if you're truly ready to do that. You say you are, 
you're eager to prove that you are by judging other cities for not following. But are you really ready? He basically asks his disciples, if the world were ending today, and I said, get out now, would you hesitate? Would you believe me? Or would you think I was jesting, like the sons-in-law? Would you say, yeah, I just gotta, and look back the way Lot's wife does, the way Lot tries to do it several different occasions. And the excuses that, that come up in these conversations, they're not bad excuses. These are good, you can't even call them excuses, they're reasons. They're good reasons. Burying a family member. Let me just go back and say goodbye to my family. Wanting the comfort of a regular place to sleep at night, to lay in your head. But Jesus, with his eyes fixed on Jerusalem, knows what's coming. And he knows, because he is aware now of what his purpose is and what his fate is, he knows that his disciples have to be able to trust and listen to his directions without thinking that they know better. Because once they get to Jerusalem, their world is going to explode. With the crucifixion and death of Jesus, their world explodes, totally changes. This man who was the Messiah now is dead. He was supposed to conquer, now he's dead? Killed by the people he was supposed to, that's not the way the movie's supposed to end. And then as it turns out, you know, Jesus asks them, are you going to be able to trust and listen to my directions? You know, like, I'll see you in Galilee, I'm going to die and be raised up in three days. As it turns out, they don't listen to him. The stories of Jesus appearing to his disciples after Easter range from them running towards Emmaus, the, the, you know, basically trying to get out of Dodge by leaving Jerusalem and traveling to Emmaus, or he finds some of them huddled in a room in Jerusalem with all of the doors and windows locked. In the Gospel of John, he finds them back to living their own lives. They're going fishing. They're not waiting for him to return at all. They don't even recognize him at first. And in the Gospel of Mark that we read this Easter, he doesn't find them at all. We're kind of left to assume that at some point they get their act together and they get it right, but how and when in the Gospel of Mark is a complete mystery to, to us. It's not until 40 days after Easter, after the resurrection, after Jesus has left the tomb, on Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit empowers them. And they begin their true work of spreading the message of Jesus. These demands of Jesus and the demands of the angels in the Old Testament they look cruel to us. They do. We all get, we all have very warm feelings, most of us, about the past. We all get sentimental for the past. We all get nostalgic for the way things were. We all have plenty of good, legitimate reasons. I won't even call them excuses, like I said before. They're reasons for doing so. It's been a shattering year. Lives, health, incomes, plans, relationships, all have been shattered. So we're all sort of grasping to find things 
that we can simply pick right back up where we left off. I have not been able to read a new book or watch a new TV show, with the exception of some of the new things my children have found to watch. I don't think I've read a new book or watched a new TV show probably for the entire year. I take that back. There's one, but it is literally about digging up the past. <laughs> I'm finding myself rereading favorites from my adolescence. I'm finding myself uh, moving from familiar TV series to familiar TV series. And I've had three new shows recommended to me in just the past month. And I've tried. I can't get into them. I mean, they're good, I can tell. But I don't have the brain capacity right now for new things, to choose new things as like leisure activities. Because I, and I think many of us, have been forced into too many new situations in the past year. And so my brain can't relax, even in front of the TV, if I have to learn new names, new settings, new relationships, how does she go with him, what is their past, I don't have the brain energy to figure that out. As we get back to normal, it's going to be very, very tempting to just settle back into our old ways of functioning. To want to go back, to want to look back, to want to spend a lot of time asking, you know, sort of, for lack of a better term, sort of Monday morning quarterbacking. Why didn't we do this sooner? Why did we wait? Why did, you know, this decision get made? Why did, you know, why did we end up doing it this way? So we have to be aware of that. I think we also have to be aware of sort of really just wanting to settle back into the way things were. It can be really good and comforting in small doses, especially on days today, like Mother's Day, where you know, we're, we're remembering our moms, we're remembering our childhoods, we're remembering how we were raised, and we're thankful for how we were raised. And I think that's good. I think that's healthy. I think that's great to be able to do that. I think it's good to remember our distant past and to celebrate it and to open up time capsules, which everyone has sworn there's nothing in it. <laughs> but I think we have to beware that we can't live our whole church lives in sentimentality and in nostalgia. Because Jesus is always pushing his disciples forward. We're still, to this day, on a journey with Jesus. That means not, as his disciples wanted to do, getting stuck in a particular place and not wanting to move forward. Our journey with Jesus is a journey forward. Maybe it's a journey to the cross. Maybe it's a journey to gaining and gaining followers. Maybe it's a journey that ends at our tomb and our unrecognizable resurrection. But it should not be a journey that stops and keeps getting stuck in nostalgia. I never knew what nostalgia actually meant until about a year ago. It actually started out as a medical term, sort of like um, a really early description 
of like post-traumatic stress. Um, there's a medical term, and, and the first part is homecoming. And the second part of the word is pain or ache. You know, it's nostalgia that has the same end as like Tylenol is an analgesic. It's the same, it's the same, I think it's three, I think it's the same root. Um, it was a medical term that was going to describe this sort of extreme homesickness, this extreme sort of melancholy that was debilitating among Swiss soldiers, Swiss mercenary soldiers, um, while they were fighting away from home. It, be, it can become painful if we are constantly dwelling in the way things were. And as Jesus puts it, we can lose sight of the work that we have in front of us. One of the new shows I have watched during the pandemic was these, it's, it's old, it's from the 80s. But it's these four Canadians who are living the pioneer life in the western, in western wilderness of, of Canada. And one of the things they have to do is learn how to plow with a horse. And one of the things that the man said was, you really have to be pushing down on that plow or it'll just kind of skip and skid along the top of the, the ground and you won't get a deep enough furrow for planting. He also said, you really have to be paying attention because that plow, you have to be focused on keeping it straight or it can get away from you. So it's like this constant pressure down and this constant pressure forward to get the right kind of furrows for planting. And that really make, helps me make sense of what Jesus is saying. If you turn to look behind you while you're working a plow, your rows for planting are not going to be deep enough, they're not going to be straight enough. Your whole field could get screwed up and you'd have to start over. You'd have to go all the way back and start over. So as Jesus is telling his followers and urging them forward, he's cautioning them. This is a journey with me. This is a journey in which things are going to get really bad. And I have to know that you're going to be able to keep moving forward. I'm going to have to know that after I die, things are going to have to keep moving towards God's kingdom. So they may sound harsh, <clears throat> and they may sound like cruel sayings. But really what Jesus is asking all of us is what are we attached to that keeps us from following Jesus fully and freely, wherever he decides to have us run. What are the reasons, <clears throat> what are the reasons that we keep bringing up when Jesus calls us forward and we resist and we kind of act like want and we say, well, what about? What are the reasons that we keep bringing up with Jesus? when he is calling us forward into new and uncomfortable things. I didn't pick this hymn this morning, but the refrain of it has been going through, well, not the refrain, just a little snippet of it, has been going through my head this whole week as I've been writing a sermon, and it's, you know, uh, Christian, love me more than these, right? All of those things, Jesus calls us for the tumult, right? That's the, that's the beginning of him. We're called to love Christ more than our past, more than our families, 
more than any of the perfectly reasonable excuses we have, any of the perfectly reasonable reasons that we have. We're to love Jesus more than those and not look back once we decide to follow. Amen. Our hymn is number 369 in the blue hymnal, O Jesus, I have promised. Gracious God, we want to thank you 
before, the ways that you have nurtured us. We want to thank you for all of the all of the folks who have brought us closer to you. All of the folks who have challenged us to move closer to you. All of the folks who have uh, really pushed us to do your will. We want to thank you for those who have cared for us from the beginnings of our lives into adulthood. We want to thank you for those whom you worked with to give us life. And God, we are thankful for those who taught us that the life you want us to live is an abundant life precious life, a cherished life. Oh God, we pray for those who did not get that message from their parents. God, motherhood is such a unique and messy and complicated relationship. It is a calling that can be feel deeply unfulfilled. It is a calling that can feel deeply unwanted. It is a calling that can be some dreams come true. We are so thankful for the times that your hand and your heart have been shown to us through a mother's love. And we pray for those who have had to find your hand and your heart in other relationships. And we thank you for those relationships as well. We pray for those mothers like Mary have watched their children be killed. We pray for those mothers who have desperately wanted wonderful things for their children, only to see those dreams go unfulfilled. God, as we hold both the positive and negative of Mother's Day, in our hands and in our hearts all at the same time. We thank you for your presence with us that helps us to do that. That your presence is constant with us. That like a mother hen, you kind of scoop us up under your wings on a rainy day like today. We ask that you do that for those in our congregation, in our neighborhoods, and in our families, and in our friendships who are hurting today, who need to be covered, who need healing, especially those God who, who kick against that healing the way your children sometimes do. God, we pray for our world. We pray for this world as, in some places, it's going to start having this privilege to open up more and more, and we're thankful for grandmothers to get to hug their grandchildren this weekend for the first time in months, if not years. We continue to pray for your wisdom and guidance as we open up. We continue to pray for your wisdom and guidance as we watch other countries like India just get hammered with death and despair. God, we pray that as we prayed last week, that as you push us forward, that you do it gently because we are still tripping into the light. 
God, we also ask that if you need to shake our shoulders and say, move now, that we would be able to hear that and not think of it as jesting or unbelievable or surely you must be joking. Help us to discern and figure out your will, both for big movements and for small movements. We pray these things in the name of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Children of God, we know that God is our source. We know that God, uh, without God, we're nothing. And so let us respond by giving back to God a portion of what God has given us. Let's receive the morning offering.
p.m. is set to music that if you lose your spot on one word, it's going to take you a minute to catch up. <laughs> because that's how it feels like to answer this call sometimes, doesn't it? I'll go where you want me to go. But I fell behind and I'm going to need to catch up. <laughs> it feels just like that. We're thankful that we have a merciful God. That as we follow and as we get pushed forward by God, just bask in God's mercy that if we trip, if we stumble, God's going to catch us and wait for us. So as you go out into the world today, know that God wants you exactly where you are. Know that God is putting you where God wants you to go. And try very hard to say and be what God wants you to say and be. And you know you don't do it alone. Because the blessing of God, the love of Jesus Christ, his son, and the fellowship and power and guidance of the Holy Spirit go with you as we continue on this journey with Christ. Keep your hymnals out because we're going to sing that last refrain again. Amen.